All right, we're back. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us, all of you who are already here, um, and for those who are to come, uh, wherever you are, welcome. Um, so uh, we've got a great week this week uh, over the holidays. Um, this is the first of a, a few shows that we're going to be doing over the next week. Um, we're, tomorrow night, we're going to be doing a tribute to uh, the great late Benny Bell of Shaving Cream fame with his uh, grandson, Joel uh, Sandberg. Um, uh, we're going to be doing a, a Christmas show with our director, Steve Korn, looking at our uh, Beyond Vaudeville Christmas show. We'll look back on that. And a tribute to Coco and Penny with Penny herself uh, talking about her late mom and her comedy team that she had with her late mom. Um, by the way, we're up to uh, 2,900 subscribers now. We've just passed that mark and uh, uh, hoping that we can hit 3,000 by the end of the year. So if you haven't already subscribed, uh, make sure you subscribe to our Beyond Vaudeville uh, channel here on YouTube uh, and like uh, the videos so that you um, can keep getting more and more of these. Um, okay, here we go. Tonight's guest. Uh, this is uh, real exciting for me. Uh, I've known this person for a number of years. Um, he was a guest on one of the episodes of Beyond Vaudeville, and we're going to be looking at that. Uh, he came on in his capacity as uh, a, a premier toy collector. Um, at one point, he had uh, the biggest uh, Planet of the Apes collection, uh, Planet of the Apes toy collection, probably in the country or the world. Um, but he's uh, a big collector of uh, toys, and he's going to share some of that stuff tonight. Um, he also was with the band The Mosquitoes. He was a drummer with The Mosquitoes. Um, they, uh, if you remember the big monkeys comeback song, that was then, this is now, that was, uh, the mosquitoes who wrote that and sold that to uh, the monkeys. Uh, he also has been a director of, uh, the infamous soul tangler, um, which was a low budget horror movie, um, shot on Long Island and is uh, legendary now. Um, I I'm so excited to have this guy and, and, uh, he actually, uh, introduced us to the legendary Suzanne Muldowney, um, underdog herself. So without further ado, let's please welcome Pat Bichau. Pat? Hey, Rich. How's it going? It's good to see you. Did I miss anything in that introduction? No, it was pretty impressive. Huh? I'm pretty impressed. Sounds like you took notes or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, we've got to get started right away with Suzanne because, um, I, I, you know, my memory is a little fuzzy on this, but I do remember that we were doing live shows, live Beyond Vaudeville shows, and uh, and then you and I had connected somehow, and you said, hey, there's this woman at these creation science fiction conventions who would probably be uh, ideal for these shows that you're doing. T tell us your memory of it. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. It was, uh, yeah, I used to do the uh, old, you know, sell the toys at the old creation convention. And, we, you know, we'd sometimes in, be in breaks, we'd go and see some shows. And I saw her doing uh, underdog ballet, which was, you know, wow, well, that's something. And, um, you know, she came by our booth and, and we talked and, and somehow she found out I made like low budget films. And so she wanted to make an underdog movie. That's how she kind of came into my life. And now as we speak, you know, I have so much junk. I have, I actually still have the script where she goes to the International Olympics, you know, the uh, Planet Olympics. And there's this guy named Relith, spelled backwards, it, it, you know, Hitler. And, you know, she has to stop him. It was kind of funny. And so anyway. Uh, by um, the way, I, I, it, yes, it's King Relta. And I'm very familiar with this. Uh, oh, but, so you know the script. But, but you're speaking to someone who... Uh, is very much interested in everything Suzanne does. So right, I'm glad right, right. you shared that with those that might not be familiar. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, it's funny you said that because, you know, she would call me like at all hours, you know, and, and it got a bit much. And like you say, we, we kind of know each other. We'll talk about that later. But, uh, you know, when I go to Beyond Vaudeville, I'm like, well, she's a perfect fit. She's a perfect fit for it. And so I suggested, and I think you actually went to a creation to see it. As I remember, actually, I got you in as a guest. I remember this now. And I said, you know, Rich, you've got to come see this. I think she'd be perfect for your shows. You did. And you guys, you know, what? 30-year relationship or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, I remember those, uh, the, the competitions they would have, uh, the costume competitions, and it would be your usual, like, Superman and Wonder Woman. And then all of a sudden, there would be underdog. 
underdog. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, she was she was really into it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I brought some uh, I, I've added some photos here that you actually shot. And uh, I thought it'd be fun to look at these and kind of talk through them, because um, these were from those early stage shows. And this was from. Uh, the very first uh, show that Suzanne appeared at. This was in 1986 with um, Danny Bonaducci from the Partridge family. Um, and, uh, and and so, Pat, you took these shots. Um, do, you, do you have any uh, memories? Yeah, I was going to say, I kind of remember him being a great sport. And he was really funny and uh, actually, you know, really nice. Uh, you know, like it's funny because, like, I know he's sort of, you know, he kind of came f- notorious later as, you know, uh, you know, like one of those celebrity show type things where you follow his life and stuff, which was kind of unfortunate. I, I thought he was really funny. I thought he was a really good sport. Uh, and yeah, it was, he was really nice. I don't know. I, I was like, to be honest with you, I was kind of surprised, but he was, he was really nice. You know? Yeah. We, we flew him out from Los Angeles because he was in the national Enquirer, Um, one of these down and out stories. He was sleeping in his car uh, oh, over geez. by the uh, Groman's theater or something. And uh, and she he just basically, you know, gave his story to the Inquirer and said, I'm broke. And and uh, so, yeah, we tracked him down, gave him an invitation to to fly out to New York and do the show. And and yeah, I agree with you. He was a, a really nice guy. And uh, this was him. Uh, uh, this was behind the scenes. I guess this was maybe before the show started. Yeah, I think he was like a little shell shocked, but like he really handled it well, I thought, you know, for someone like to your point, like flew in and okay, this is where you're going to go. You're going to go here. And I, you know, he was, I think he, you know, a, a little overwhelmed at first, but he, he went with it, you know, he really did. I remember that. And here she is. This yeah. was uh, her very first performance that uh, she ever did with us, Suzanne Muldowney, and uh, as as underdog. And um, the nice shot you took there of her yeah. with those crummy it's those crummy disc cameras. I don't know if you remember them, which is kind of sad. Like they're the worst uh, camera lenses and stuff. Like this is before, like you know, your phone takes so much better pictures now. You know, but <laughs> even like a regular thirty-five millimeter, I would have been better off. But you know, what are you gonna do? Well, you you caught the action. Yeah. Uh, this was a guy who um, uh, uh, we knew at uh, NYU uh, who would perform as uh, Lance Venture, um, and uh, uh, Lance would um, emote to uh, music. And um, it was interesting that you you sent this picture of him because, uh, um, yeah, he, he's uh, he's kind of MIA. We're not sure where where uh, Bob is uh, these days, but. Uh, yeah, it's funny. I didn't really remember. I didn't really remember him, but I, you know, I had the photo, you know, so I, that's why I sent it. But uh, yeah, that I kind of draw a blank on, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, there he is. Man. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the next year uh, we would do these shows annually, and our our celebrity host was uh, Al Lewis. And uh, how about memories of Al Lewis? Uh, people, I, you, know, again, I, you know, it's funny, like you know, because you know the situation and. And, and, you know, it's kind of like odd acts and, you you know, your show called Later Oddville, I guess, you know, it, it, you know, you were really trying to get out there with with the performers. And, uh, you know, so when, when you'd have these celebrity hosts, uh, I definitely think they were a little like shocked by it. But like I say, he went with it. And, uh, you know, he was like a, a Borscht Belt type of guy, right? I mean, he was always trying to do a joke here and there. And I, I guess he liked, the, you know, I think he liked the idea that like young people were like into him, you know, thought he was funny and, you know, I, but he was very nice. I thought he was great. And that's my buddy Lance, who, uh, you know, we, we haven't been, uh, I just saw him actually recently, but we've been sort of out of touch for a while. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we had that, we loved that picture so much. We sent it as our Christmas card one year. So that's kind of funny. I always remember that. I was like, oh, that was great. Yeah. yeah. So Lance, yeah, your, uh, your friend and fellow toy collector and, right. uh, and, uh, both you guys, uh, came on beyond vaudeville and we're going to, we're going to watch that in just a little bit. Right. right. Um, and, that's uh, here's another great shot you took of Al. Right. And, right. And, you know, uh, Rich, uh, we were talking earlier, like I always say I have so much stuff, but it's hard for me to find it. And, um, you know, I, what's killing me is I have a, a VHS of uh, Adam West when he hosted. 
but of ah. course I couldn't find it, you know, and it was like, I cut the, sh like, I actually cut it. It was like back in the old days where you, you know, VHS to VHS. So it's kind of choppy and stuff, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, he was pretty good. The only, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, that was before the next is Adam the next year. Uh, yes. And yeah. in uh, 1988 and, um, uh, Adam West, uh, Batman and, um, uh, uh, I, I actually have, yeah, tons of footage of all these live shows okay. and I'm oh. going to be sharing more and more of it, uh, with everybody. Uh, so, um, uh, keep watching people. Yeah. We're going to, yeah. we're going to have lots of footage of these, uh, from these shows. That's um, it. and, uh, now, um, also at this show, uh, I, I remember, uh, Suzanne had done, um, her performance as Vlad the Impaler, her oh, right. tribute to Dracula. Um, do you have any memories of that? Uh, yeah, I kind of remember it being dramatic, I guess. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. It's like, do I have any photos of that? Like now I'm like trying to go crazy, which, you know, <laughs> of course I'll find when we finish this interview, I'll find tons of tons of that stuff. But you know, I couldn't somewhere under all the toys. But she didn't do that very. That's the only time I I know her of her performing that. And, gotcha. You know, as I saw, you know, because like you say, like when she did the creation conventions and the other things, I and and uh, I remember she did Supergirl once. Oh, that was with uh, Adam West. Sorry, yeah, yeah, that was yeah. Uh, Underdogs usually her default, but she does have these other characters. As yeah. Well. yeah. Um, Coco and Penny. So I just mentioned earlier, um, uh, Penny, we lost Coco uh, uh, just a few years ago, uh, but Coco is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Penny is still with us uh, and uh, is going to be joining us for one of these live streams. Um, do you exactly. remember uh, this comedy? Oh, team? yeah, I, I love them. I thought they were great. And she, you know, uh, yeah, they were terrific. I really enjoyed them. And, you know, the mom was funny. And and uh, uh, did they, they did other gigs too, right? I mean, they were like, performers i mean you'd you know they would do i mean they did your show but they did like uh you could see them out as i remember oh yeah yeah they yeah. they were doing uh uh stand-up clubs and they ended up appearing on david letterman and um oh, there you go. Yeah. franklin and yeah, yeah they, they made the rounds um yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is another team, a husband and wife team uh irene Wiedenburner and her husband john um, she would sing saucy songs and, uh, and he would, uh, tell dirty jokes and they'd do serious songs. What, what do you remember about these two? Uh, I remember liking them very much. And I, you know, I think, you know, like, uh, I reached out to him. He was a retired police officer and, uh, he was actually in Soul Tangler. He, he's at the very end of the movie. He plays, uh, uh, you know, uh, chief of police, which was so much fun. And, uh, he was really nice and a sweet guy. And he came out. To, you know, we basically called him up and said, you know, can you be there at 8 a.m. or something like that? And he was. And we just made up the lines and he kind of butchered them. But that was kind of fun. And to be honest with you, in, in not to get too lost on that thing, but that's like my favorite scene in Salt Tanger with the old guys doing their talk and stuff. And I thought he was just a riot and he was really friendly. And if I if you don't mind me jumping, uh, you, Sammy Petrillo was in the Adam West show, right? And yes. th th what makes me think of that, because they did sort of similar kind of jokes. Uh, we were, I remember uh, Lance was in, I'd film and Lance would interview them. And I remember he's, uh, you know, uh, uh, they would do those like kind of old time jokes. And so Lance was setting up a joke, you know, going, I wanted to be a cab driver, you know, but I couldn't hack it, right? That bad joke. But he goes, I wanted to be a cab driver. And Sammy Patrol goes, thank God you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> we just burst out laughing we had to stop filming it was so funny but you know they had that similar kind of uh you know talking the way they did that yeah the that, batter that, and the old school yeah. uh yeah. yeah and um yeah i remember john Wiedenbrenner. um we were getting ready to start one of these shows and we couldn't find him anywhere and um irene his wife who is uh known as the gong show queen of long island she was I, uh they, they, were from, yeah. they were from baldwin long island and she would go around and play all the talent shows and gong shows that were present in bars at that time and in, in late 70s early 80s um anyway uh irene said oh he's outside waiting for the time the meter to change so so I went outside and I found him sitting in his car with one of those little uh, more dirty joke books. Oh, <laughs> and he was just, you know, practicing before he went on. And oh. I, I remember one of his jokes. Um, 
I, I probably won't do it justice, but it was something like uh, uh, a guy walks into uh, the Woolworth building and uh, as he's getting into the elevator, his right elbow accidentally bumps into this woman's left breast. And he says, excuse me, madam, but if your heart is as soft as your breast, you must be a wonderful person. And she said to him, well, listen, honey, if your Rodney is as hard as your elbow, I'm in room 324. <laughs> that, yep, that sounds like him. That was a classic. Is, is John still with us? Do you know, or have you lost contact with him? Or? Uh, the the Whedon burners are no longer with us. Uh, oh, okay. uh, sorry to say, but you mm -hmm. know, um, and you know, I mean, they would be very old by this point. Right, 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 <laughs> so, right. Yeah, yeah. This yeah, was yeah. 1987. We're looking at, and yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's un yeah. unfortunately, you know, it's it's been a while. Um, uh, let's see what else do we have here. Oh, there's oh, uh, yeah, that's Lance talking to him like that. Yeah, I don't know if you know Lance would hold a hairbrush and just pretend it was a microphone, and everybody <laughs> went along with it. It was kind of funny. <laughs> it really worked. But, uh, that was uh, John Wiedenbrenner again there, and yeah. then uh, we would always end the show with the happy line where everybody would come out, and uh, there's uh, D Nack, the female Elvis in the uh, Elvis <laughs> suit, oh, and right, yeah, sure. uh, to her right uh, was the guy who had scaled uh, the um, Dakota building and and uh, broke into a Yoko Ono's apartment. Oh my goodness. Um, and uh, the, in the middle there in the t shirt is Chairman Steve, the poet laureate of Greenwich. Oh, I remember him. Yeah, I remember him. Uh, and then the two guys, uh, the guy holding up the record album, that's uh, the comedy team of Book and Martino. Do you remember those guys? Yeah, not really. Yeah, no. Yeah. And, and, and what were they a com the comedy act? They were, just they were another comedy act. Yeah. It really uh, certainly had a lot of. Um, <laughs> A lot of comedy teams going on. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That was the that was the age. But the, yeah, well, Coco, Coco and Penny were definitely uh, really fun. They were, I really enjoyed them. Oh, there we go. Yeah. And there's uh, that's Suzanne. That's uh, yeah, the next year uh, where she did her Supergirl. And that was with Adam West, as I remember. Right. I remember yeah. that. She was that's very cool. excited to meet him, which is yeah. funny because she's not like. Uh, She's not so star impressed, but Adam West, you know, it did it for her. You know, she was like, a, she was very excited. Yeah. Uh, we're getting some uh, comments here. Sir Topham Hat, uh, oh, a little nod to uh, Thomas there, the tank engine. Uh, Sir Topham Hat says, last time I heard Rodney use as an epithet was BS Pulley. Highly recommended. Uh, wow. You know your showbiz history. Yeah, sir. wow. That's right. That's impressive. Uh, Amy Fushauer Kelly asking, is DNAC still around? Uh, yes, I believe so. And uh, we'll have to uh, track her down. And uh, uh, Sir Topham Hat is also saying, hey, Pat, uh, EMC here, digging your, sp your spiel as always. <laughs> uh, Louise Millman saying, hello, Pat and oh, yeah. Rich. Yeah. Um, Dennis Devine asking a question for Mr. Pichau. Are there any vintage toys that are overlooked, which he considers to be collectible? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there, uh, to be honest with you, I think there are tons. And sometimes, uh, you know, it's funny, like, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of stuff. And sometimes if I don't feel it's like it, they're getting the right price, I, I don't sell them. You know, I just I just keep them. Uh, an ex example I would use is Gremlins. I mean, it's slowly, it's now getting hot, but like for the longest time, I was, you know, when you equate it to stuff that was from its time, that was way worth more. And I never got it because like they made a stripe and they made a gizmo. And I'm like, how can, how are these not so desirable? Because, you know, it was a huge movie. And it, like you talk to, like if you talk to somebody in their 40s, Gremlins is like the biggest thing in the world, you know, and so it's slowly catching up. But that was that's the one I always think of in my head, like that one, like I don't understand. And they were always like, uh, you know, it's funny when you think of toys, uh, you think of as a kid, eight to ten, maybe twelve is like whatever was popular with you. That's the thing that you latch on to and you hold on to. And so sometimes uh, if you were a strange age. Uh, a toy like uh, Spiral Zone or Sectors or Mask and that kind of stuff to the broader public is not as uh, like a G.I. Joe mask, same time, Transformers, but mask somehow lags behind. And mm -hmm. so it's funny because then you do get those guys who are like, I don't care. I want it. Sectors. That was that was one of the big ones where they were like, 
you wore it like a puppet and the guy ha had his hand on it and stuff. So yeah, they're, they're actually tons, you know, is it um, now, you know, there were always knockoffs, right? Like GI yeah. Joe always had these, like, you know, these crappy knockoffs that would be, you know, you'd, you'd see them in the uh, toy oh, store, like a, in, pop off. In a bag. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like just hanging from a rack. Is there any value in those those cheap knockoffs? Oh, absolutely. And actually, the cert and certain ones are obviously better than others. But like to your point, it's like ones that were known. And uh, you know, not to get too off subject, but one of the most uh, King of Queens did an episode on where uh, th they wanted this thing from when they were a kid, and uh, and his wife said, "Oh, I got it for you," and he, a thing, and it turned out it was the knockoff, and it was thing. So it was, it was like it was, and and Patton Oswalt obviously was involved. They went to a toy convention. I was like, boy, whoever wrote this is a toy collector. I mean, it was spot on, you know, and. Uh, so, yeah, there are, you know, it's funny you mentioned, I had some uh, uh, Brave Star. I don't, you, you know, this is probably after your, our time kind of, but I'm a toy guy, so I'm totally into it. Uh, and they made these knockoffs of Brave Star, and they were insanely valuable, way more valuable than I thought. I remember I put them out on eBay, and I was like, oh, I'd like to get 25 bucks a piece for them. And they went for $750, $650. They were like, wow. they were insane. They, so they were known. That's got to be the big thing is people got to know what they are because who would want it? And then it's like a popular thing. So, and then, but to your point, I also bought a ton of these uh, Ninja Turtle knockoffs, which I thought were the coolest thing in the world. Junk. <laughs> they don't sell at all. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to guess what's good and what's bad, you know? Yeah. The, the thing that surprised me was, uh, you know, I, I was selling some of my old stuff and um, a couple of years ago. And one of the things that surprised me was how valuable little uh, serial giveaways were like, oh, uh, right, right, right. you know, the, I mean, not the kind of value I'm sure of some of the stuff you have, but I was no, just surprised. Some of it was how much really value, you know, and you know, it's funny. It's, it's similar to the stock market. I always say like the, 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 um, the collector from 35 to 45, that's the sweet era. So it moves, you know, like stuff that I, like what we had as a kid, like this kind of stuff, it's like the stock market, it goes down because what, like it's the famous thing. A rare thing always is rare. So it's always desirable. But like the the uh, the common thing, like when people get into collecting and it goes up because people want it, but then people have it, you know. And the example I always use when I first started getting into collecting, you know, it's because I uh, the story I always tell was uh, I remember seeing I was in high school and I saw some G.I. Joe's at a garage sale. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. I remember these, but what am I going to do with them? I didn't, you know, like, I, yeah, I loved them as a kid, but who cares? I had no clue. Oh, you can collect them like as a collectible. Well, that's, that's, that was how I got it. And so I was going to say, when I first got involved in working with people who did it, Howdy Doody was the biggest thing in the world, <laughs> biggest, hottest thing in the world. And obviously before our time, like, you know, Howdy Doody, it's like this whole thing. And now, psh, you know, you couldn't give it away because, wow. you know, what happens, you know? And so uh, it's a, it's an interesting nostalgia thing. And then like, you got to say like, don't forget, like, like we always talk about this with cable TV and stuff, the pie gets smaller and kids now go to video games at a much earlier age. So it's much because the, the toy that's desirable is the one that was around that you, you play with for four or five years, you know, and now that four or five years is going to two years so it gets a it gets tough, you know, and uh, yeah, and it's like, course, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, no, I was just going to say, um, you know, I had a number of the 78 uh, RPM records and and those, uh, you know, you cannot <laughs> thrift shops don't want them. because yeah, no, 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 be, nobody, nobody will buy them. Always, that if it, when we had the store, people would always try to sell it. I mean, to be honest with you, if you had something like a, a movie or somebody person, you know, that might be OK. But for the most part, yeah, nobody wanted them. And, and like they all and but everybody saw value in it. I always say that's a curse of a collectible, too. When people see value, that's no good. Like to your point, cereal prizes. Who saw cereal prizes? Nobody. Cereal right. boxes. Who kept a cereal box? That be, made it desirable. Life magazine. Everybody thought that looked great. National Ge Geographic. Oh, it looks so good. Everybody kept them. Nobody so it's, it's interesting you ask that because uh, we have a question in the chat from Ron Pitt. Can you ask how valuable my collection of National Geographics might be? 
I have yeah. thousands going back almost a hundred years. Yeah, it's kind of sad. Yeah, it's kind of sad. I, I agree. They look beautiful. They look gorgeous. But it's like everybody kept them. I, you know, I have to speak. You know, just between you and Rich, don't forget, I'm sort of out of this business for. I mean, I, I'm trying to get rid of what I have, but I'm not really a guy for the, like the last twenty years. So things could change. I right. want to sort of stipulate that, but. Uh, yeah, it was like famous, and it's it's to your point. It's it was a uh, it was a very um, you know people thought it was value. So yeah, so yeah. Um, so, you kind of, so you do have a couple of things there. Uh, Amy Kelly is asking: uh, Is either of those the GI Joe that appeared in the Beyond Vaudeville episode with Pat? Oh, that's a great question. I doubt it. <laughs> I, I, you know, just in the, you know, it's funny you say because th there's a couple of items that I've had since like back then, but more often than not, it seems like I get it, and that's sort of like the treasure hunt is the fun. Having it is not as I mean, I don't know. I, I you know, I, I, like to your point when you were talking about my Planet of the Ape collection, I used to love uh, one of my favorite things. I, I used to collect uh, Matt Mason and. It was hard to find, you know, you'd go to shows and didn't see anything. And so I switched to Planet of the Apes because they merchandised it through everything. So when I'd go to a show, I'd find something, you know, and that's what started. It was like, you just got sick of not finding stuff, you know, yeah. and they made every puzzles, trash cans, you know, and in a way those became my, uh, Favorite thing when the weirder it was, uh, like a, a Planet of the Apes flashlight, the more I liked it. My prized possession was, uh, uh Planet of the Apes Chocolate Lollipop by Howard Johnson's. And it was in the package. That was like my prize collection. I love, and it, not to get too lost in this, I'm just telling you some stupid uh, Marabilia stories. Uh, and it's funny because now it's so different. But I got, uh, I was in Seattle and I got a, a Planet of the Apes a Tommy gun with a mask like a, in, the, in the package, which was a very desirable, cool item. And I was taking it on the plane and they were like, that's a gun. <laughs> you can't take it on the plane. And so I was like, oh, you know, this is before 9-11, everything. Of course, everybody would know that now, but back then. And I was like, oh. And so then they were like, um, you know, like, uh, you know, there's a FedEx and I was trying to mail it and they didn't have a box big enough. They go, well, we can take it apart. I'm like, no, 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 don't take it apart. Don't take it. And so I, I went back and I pleaded. So it went into the uh, cockpit. So wow. the, the pilot took it. And then he gave it back to me at the end of the flight, which I, it was funny. I was like, but it's a toy. But they were like, no, that, you know, which I understand, but I just remember that was like a crazy story. And, uh, but I got it and I got it home. So that's, uh, we're definitely getting into some minutiae here with toys and I love it. I mean, anyone that, that watches beyond vaudeville knows in the opening of the show, we'd always show these, these uh, cool, you know, things, these, these items, you, you mentioned major Matt Mason. That was another, um, the, the little um, astronaut toys. Oh, you've got one right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got them right there. I got, what I, got they? I got a box. This is a, in the box if I figured out how to use it. Yeah. Wow. Cool kit. I really love that. That was one of my faves. You know, it's funny you say that because, again, that was the space age. And you know what killed it when they land on the moon? When they landed <laughs> on the moon, the, the toy died. Isn't that interesting? I guess nobody, you know, I was very strange. Well, I had some of those uh, in my parents' uh, basement, which, um, you know, is uh, uh, musty and mildewy. And uh, they were in a bag and they had, you know, just dirt, mildew all over them. And I tried to just kind of rub some off. I was like, oh, this isn't coming off. So I just threw them up on eBay. And uh, I couldn't believe the bidding that went on for these mildewed. I even wrote, I took clear pictures. I said, these smell, these are dirty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they didn't care. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, they're harder to find. But, you know, to your point, it's, uh, uh, you know, I guess it, it, it's because uh, I would think that that's starting to go away, Major Matt Mason, because, you know, the, when you get older, it's, it's you know, like, you know, G.I. Joe at least like kind of went through generations, you know. Right. And what else is that? That looks like an Aurora model there. Is yeah, I, I was hoping I could tell you uh, this was a uh, this was like a favorite. I have the whole collection, but I, I just put this up here and it, I just got to tell you a quick story. It was uh, it was put out, you know, during the famous monster days. I thought I had another one to show you, but I can't find. Oh, yeah, here we go. And uh, it was uh, they, they did a character called the victim. And like it was a woman who like the Frankenstein's supposed to hunt down. And so of course parents got a, like got a win and they, they had the torture chamber and all this crazy stuff. And 
parents got it and like, what are you doing? Like, you can't have this. And it's very funny because there was Dr. Deadly. He was the, the bad guy. And so they renamed it Dr. Deadly's daughter, which <laughs> if you think about it, that's kind of even worse, you know? And, uh, and that was like a favorite of mine as a kid because like parents like banned it and they were like, and they like, you know, it's outrage. Like, can you believe that's in the store? And so, but was the kid, victim, that makes you, draws you to it, you know? Was the victim actually from a movie? I No, no. It was like funny. They made a Vampirella, Dr. Dead, a Vampirella was uh, from, from the, uh, from the Warren publications. And then they made Frankenstein. I don't know how they got the license for that because it's, you know, it's definitely the Boris Karloff thing, but they, you know, here he is holding the victim, you know? And then, uh, the, yeah, some of the things were like called the torture chamber. I, let's see if I have a, I have the whole set, but I didn't, uh, you can see here, uh, the torture chamber and uh, the hanging cage. And it was like crazy, you know, I, when I, well, even now when I think about it, I was like, what, how did like, and my parents didn't care, I guess, but you know, that, that was, you know, it made us want it more because it was like, they were so outraged, you know, it's like, that's like, uh, you know, that's what kids want. You know? I remember I had a uh, Phantom of the Opera, and part of it glowed in the dark. Didn't oh yeah, I love those. Those are the 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 square kits. I I don't have any more of those, but yeah, I had all of them. Yeah, the Hunchback. They had the whole Universal line. You know, it's funny. Uh, you know, TV uh, would show the black and white Universals, which uh, kids loved, and like so, it got a new generation. You know, like our dad saw that in the theater. And then, like, when they show it, you know, your dad, you'd watch it with your dad, and you're like, oh, these are great. And uh, so they started licensing, his, you know, a ton of that stuff. You know, that has a lot to do with it, too, like licensing. And, uh, you know, like, I was just going to say, like, in the, and then in the 80s, uh, like He-Man and stuff, where they actually uh, create the cartoon for the toy line. You know what I mean? Because they would, there was a law changed because they used to couldn't do that. That was, like, illegal. Like, G.I. Joe couldn't have a TV show back when we were kids, but then they changed that rule. And then they started making toys for the, you know, they, they make the show for the toys. So it's like a half hour commercial. All right. In like 1988, I think the gem doll came out. Yeah. 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 All that stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, transformers, all yeah. that, all that stuff. Yeah. It's, it was a very different environment. You know, uh, Ron is asking, can you ask Pat, does he have a collectible toy that he sold too soon or too cheaply that he wishes he could have back a million, a million toys, a million. The, you know, I, it's funny. I remember uh, I sold one uh, a GI Joe, as a matter of fact, and I got like a hundred dollars for it. And I thought, like, oh my god, that's like the best thing in the world. And uh, you know, it recently sold for like three thousand. You know, it was like way. Uh, the other thing was, I remember, you know, like I say, with investing in toy collectibles back in the day, right? Uh, I uh, models. They, they had these superpower toys. Yeah, I still have a couple left. And they just sold them for two bucks a piece, right? And I, I'm, I'll never forget, I, I filled the wagon with them and came up to the, and they were like, you're buying all these? Like they couldn't understand it. So I would sell those for like, you know, so I bought them for two. So I'd sell them for six, eight, like, oh, it's great. Oh, they're worth hundreds, thousands. And I, you wow. know, so I, that's, you talk to any collectors that's been doing it for 20 years and they have that story. <laughs> any, any collector will have that story. I guarantee it. Guarantee. But then there are probably, like you were saying, also those stories where you're glad you sold when the market was high. And yeah, yeah, yeah. They're right. That's, that's, and that's a good point, too. That's a good point because we were talking about cereal boxes and cereal prices. They've kind of cooled off. You know, they're not as big as they were. Uh, yeah. yeah. And but so, yeah, no, but, but, uh, you know, the other thing I was going to say, the people who do the best where like their collections are really like changed their lives. They have so, you know, is the actual collector, the guy who wants it, no matter what he's buying it and people think he's nuts. And what are you doing? I don't have that one. I don't have it with the arm. It's got a better eye. And, you know, that, and, and, you know, it has the alternate blue cover, whatever. In the end, those guys are always the ones that sell it for the millions. Because they had that that mentality, you know. Whereas you, uh, I would, I tended to buy the thing that was cheap, and then it would be worth money, which is never going to, you know, necessarily find the super super rare ones. It's the, you have to collect it like a maniac to get those. You know? Now, how about we've got a, a question, a, a comment in chat from Michael DiMaggio saying, "I have the complete Green Ghost game." Now there oh. were a couple of these, like Witch Witch, and yeah, and yeah. 
like horror themed board games that yeah, yeah green ghost is a good one that's a good one and, and you know it's funny you mentioned that even as a kid remember thinking that was the coolest looking game you ever saw but when you actually played it it was terrible i don't know if you remember if you ever played it and uh you know just on a side note a funny thing uh that movie ouija came out a couple years back right and and so my son was like, what is that? And I said, oh, like the Ouija board, you know, you, you know, you used to play Ouija, and, you know, and call it, he goes, you would play a game to call up ghosts. And I'm like, yeah, you know, you, you would just you know, get in a Toys R Us. And he's Toys R Us sold a game to call up ghosts. I mean, <laughs> it's like, he could not wrap his head around it. It was like, that is so weird. But, uh, you know, like you say, witch, witch, the, it, horror was a big thing for us, you know, and actually that green ghost game in the package, that's that's worth something. That is a good, <laughs> nice. a good piece. And and uh, yeah, I remember uh, there would be some games where <clears throat> maybe as a as a little kid, I wouldn't quite understand how to play the game the way it was supposed to be played. But I would just like elements of it. Like there was a game with these pop tops where you would push these things down and they'd spring up and pop. Um, yeah. And uh, or you know, like it's, so you know, we would end up well, just mousetrap. Even like if you think of it, you never wanted yeah. to play, you just build it and make it go. You didn't want to play the game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the game was just weird, right? It's like, yeah. you know, okay, now I have to add this part to the contraption, and now I add this part. Yeah. And there were like a lot of those contraption games, right? Like, yeah, uh, that was big. You know, the one that I think of when you talk about not really wanting to play the game but love to set off the thing, it was this thing called Spies of Poppin', and this girl is going to be. Uh, run up to a thing and a bomb is going to go off and you kind of have to stop her and so we used to just like watch it go up and goes flying <laughs> it's like we didn't play the game uh uh so we've got uh vox clementis says all my toys went missing stolen or thrown out by my mom which um yeah that's why these a lot of these that's toys a are very broken. that is a very common tale and actually i remember one time uh, i was living in portchester at the time and they and they used to have this one night where you would throw anything out in garbage. Like, you you know, you could just, it didn't matter. No recyclers, whatever. And I remember going and I found that this guy was selling the, I mean, he was throwing out boxes of amazing toys. And I'm like, this is amazing. And I met, I went to the house and the woman was clean. I said, look, I'll buy it from you. You know, because like, who knows what you're, you know, whatever. And so she was like, what? And so, and I bought it for like $20, $30, very little. And she, you know, and I said, oh, that guy is going to be so sad when he comes home and he lost all these toys because he had nutty mads. Do you remember those? And it was like all these crazy stuff. Yeah. Uh, and and, uh, Vox is also saying, I had a weird one, Hugo. You would put scars and mustaches and beards on this bald headed man. Okay. I oh, think okay. this is our perfect entry. Yeah, it is. It is into your episode of Beyond yeah. Vaudeville. So, um, you and your friend Lance um, were on the show in 1991 with uh, Carl Stroiken, who uh, wound up on a cereal box for the Adams Family, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, right. Oh, I remember that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Izzy Fertel in his very first appearance uh, on the show, Tiny Tim's protege, uh, who we were very excited to have on. Uh, and Leslie Holcomb, who we uh, had on as uh, one of our resident uh, comic book collectors, um, uh, who we also would meet uh, at the conventions. And the patches, the guy, the Star Trek patches, right? Uh, okay. Yes, that's right. He had Star Trek. I, I, sometimes I blend them together. Yeah, I used to watch the show. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to just run uh, some clips uh, from your appearance on the show. All right. No, uh, no, and no, we're no, starting no. off with... Uh, Izzy, I think this was um, right before uh, we were about to introduce you guys. Uh, Izzy Fertel took it upon himself to start talking about um, his terrible housing conditions in the Bronx. Oh, um, which was just an example of uh, you never really knew what anybody was going to say on Beyond Vaudeville. Um, and I'm sure uh, that was a tough act for you guys to follow. But uh, <laughs> Here we go. Let's take a look at this. And in the meanwhile, uh, everyone, you've been uh, sending some great questions and uh, and, you know, continue to put them in there and we'll try to get to them uh, before we're through here. Okay, uh, so good. let's take a look at Lance and Pat from 1991. One thing that is a very urgent thing right now with us and maybe I can get some help from the studio audience and from the audience listening to the show. We're living in a very, very bad building in the Bronx right now. That's very... Uh, Bed, and we'd like to move to another apartment. 
and uh, we're living at 66 West Tremont. And it's very bad. There's a lot of drug problems, and it's just my daughter's life has been threatened and so forth, and it's been very bad. And if anyone could help us in getting another apartment, a nice, nice neighborhood away from there, that uh, we could pay around uh, 500 a month or so. Okay. All right. Well, all right. So everyone hear that. If anyone can uh, help out, that would be great to help uh, Mr. Fertel, who's a great uh, talent. And uh, now, uh, by the way, that that uh, it sounds like Darth Vader's in the room. I, I think it was Leslie Holcomb breathing into his uh, microphone. Off. Yeah, I remember. I remember. Yeah, it, it's uh, the, the you know, the, the technical there, there were so many technical issues, you know, on this show, the white balances off a little bit on the camera. Uh, and the microphones, you know, there was virtually no audio mixing and, uh, um, you know, often we couldn't get a mic and then we finally get a mic on somebody and uh, it's picking up his breathing too heavily. Um, but <laughs> anyway, here we go. Let's uh, and there's Hugo right in the foreground. Yeah, there he is. Yeah. Yeah. So all these things are, are from uh, you guys from uh, your collections. And uh, there's the, the uh, look, what's that Lancelot Link uh, secret? It's Teleforms. Colorform set. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, all right, let's let's move on. Oh, uh, not to uh, uh, go on to anything uh, silly, but uh, after that, uh, Mr. Fertel, but we do have something uh, light, lighter, you know, that we'd like to uh, show. Uh, we have uh, Lan uh, Lance and Pat are, are good friends of the program, and they have all kinds of neat uh, stuff that they collect. And uh, please welcome them. They're going to show us some good stuff. Hi, Frank. How are you doing today? Okay, now you want to say which one's Lance and which one's I'm Frank? Not, I'm Pat. Okay. Uh, now, you have a whole table of stuff there, and uh, maybe you can uh, talk, to, uh, talk to us about some of it. Uh, yeah, sure, Frank. Well, we'll be glad to. Uh, a lot of people enjoy collecting, and they remember these great times from their childhood, and they want to capture a little bit of that time, so uh, often they decide to do that in toys. And as you can see here, we have many different uh, things that were from their past, and perhaps from their uh, early breakfast mornings and different things like that, character people, and Lance wants to say a few things. <clears throat> and there's a most popular is G.I. Joe, and he's making the box over there. Um, Do you have the bald G.I. Joe? or the, the, uh, No, the that's Air very Man. rare. We Unfortunately, we don't have that. Oh. We have him with the, the, uh, the perm. Fuzz. Oh, yeah. Okay. The uh, uh, the one I have is bald. This is rare, you say, with the bald. Well, it's yeah, older. That's from the sixties. This is from the seventies. Oh. But m mine has a foot missing. Does that matter? Yeah. Well, that's, that's, yeah. That... I'm afraid it does. Yeah, it's... And it doesn't have the box. You need the box too. The yeah. kids Make tend it... to throw that out. Yeah. yeah. Oh boy. And I think it's the collecting that they enjoy. Okay. And uh, now one thing there, the one in the back, Hugo. I remember him. He was the man of a thousand faces, right? That's correct. Right. And uh, and was that a popular toy? Uh, that you go popular in his yep. time, but now I guess people have forgotten about it, and they know the new toys of today, right. Pee Wee or or something like that. And Pee Wee often uses Hugo in his uh, when he's to do that stand up routine. Kind oh. of a connection there. Yeah. So oh. that's that's uh, that's why we bring it on the show. Now you also have a lot of cereal boxes. Yes. Are those are those valuable? You collect the. They're they're popular, but they're very hard to find because people just threw them out. Who would think of saving it, you know? And that's what often happens with right. this collecting market: is people throw it out. Right. If people kept it. I guess nobody would want to collect it, and, and therefore bring back the memories and yeah, right. bring it all together. Are you, are you supposed to keep the cereal? Like, so, so if you see cereal boxes now, you should save them. A lot of people ask that. You don't have to save the cereal. It's okay to yeah, throw, throw out the cereal, cereal as long as you don't ruin the box. Um, and yeah, some people tend to keep this cereal, and that kind of gets bugs, and and well, you know, and it's not so good for the box, I don't think. And a lot of parents get upset because it's like in the basement and stuff like that, and that's why we don't recommend that at right. home. So do take the cereal out. Right uh, now, uh, Mr. Stryken, do you collect anything at all? Have you uh, do you collect things or? Uh, no, I don't. No. <laughs> well, maybe this would be a good way for you to start. Yeah. It looks yeah. like there's a lot you can uh, make there. And uh, Mr. Fertel, do you collect things? Uh, uh, no, my main thing is sticking to composing songs, I guess. Okay, well, you should listen to weather forecast, news. My favorite program in the morning is NBC News at sunrise, things like that. Well, you should stick with what you're what you're good at, right? Uh, I guess like so. And uh, now, uh, actually, uh, Leslie, uh, you do collect uh, things. Yes, I'm a collector. And you could show some of your, your things too that you brought the, with you. Yes. Today. As we agreed on last night, I bought a collection of Star Trek patches. The camera might want to get a close up on some of this. There's also three hats with the same pants with different colors to the hat. 
sort of light black and blue that I know of of that hat. The, the top of patches you see here are from the original Star Trek series. Okay. Back in the 60s. The next one was, was I think, pretty much used only in the first Star Trek movie that I know of. Okay. And the last, well, that, the furthest one for me, I think may have been commemorating Star Trek The Next Generation, though I don't think you saw much of them in the series. Mm hmm And uh, now the new Star Trek movie is going to be coming out, right? Yes, from what I hear, it's going to be Star Trek VI. I don't know exactly what the storyline is going to be like, you know, but you probably have to wait and see what, what it's like when it comes out. Well, I, I heard there's a rumor that one or more of the characters might actually uh, be killed in this one. I don't know. And, and then in, in the seven one, they're going to bring the, new, the next generation. That's what I heard about the next generation. The seventh would be the next generation movie. Oh. But as far as Sarah being killed off, I'm not too sure if I heard anything about that. Okay. Now, uh, now, Lance and Pat, uh, uh, he has a very specialized collection. Some right. people do, like, special Often things. Often that's the case. Like, some people like just Planet of the Apes or just, say, H.R. Puffin stuff. Or Star Trek is a very desirable collectible. Okay. And that's what it's about. People have to find their own little thing, and they can use it that way. Uh, and we're also interested in knowing about you. If you collect, we are having a little contest, and we'd like you to... Uh, Send us a photo of your collection, and perhaps you can win a little prize. It's the it's the myth, the most innovative way you can photograph your collection. Oh. Maybe it's I not, can photograph my stuff and right. send it. Right, it's not a good idea. It's not what you have; it's how you photograph it. Yeah. And so, Frank, so, I think that's a good idea. Who knows? You could come away a winner. Maybe you know if you know? I have the uh, GI Joe, I could set it up so you wouldn't see his foot off, right? That's the idea. In the background. See, now, now you're thinking the correct way, okay. and that's what we want. Maybe well, one day we'll find a foot for you. Well, okay. In this Rio, there's Begin, and we have President Reagan. Do you know what a Reagan Begin means to me? A Reagan Begin means the rainbow of peace, there'll be no end so. We just hope the whole world will be free. We know that taxes are being reduced and that will be so neat. Let's keep them both in office now and knock us off our feet. Okay. It's the old as bacon and we have okay. President Reagan. So stand up and cheer. The happy days are here. Yay! Don't mind uh, David. I think he's upset from what Joey uh, said before. Uh, now, Mr. Fertel, now maybe if you could do Rock Around the Clock in uh, Yiddish. I yes, think that's I'm very good. special. Eins, a Säge, zwei, a Säge, drei, a Säge, Rock. Vier, a Säge, fünf, a Säge, sechs, a Säge, Rock. Sieben, a Säge, acht, a Säge, nein, a Säge, Rock. Mit Rock in a Rund, en Säge bei Nacht. Mit Rocket in Rocket, this is Baron Todd. Mit Rocket in Rocket, I run them Sega by now. When the Sega Dog thinks in three and three, does it sight with Fangan and Nye? Mit Rocket, I run them Sega by now. Mit Rocket in Rocket, this is Baron Todd. Mit Rocket in Rocket, I run them Sega by now. Great. Did I just see you look at your watch there, Pat? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it must have been. <laughs> you guys were on and you were, you know, doing your thing. And, and uh, yeah, what was it? Uh, were you guys prepared? I guess you had been to the live show, so you were kind yeah, of yeah, No, it. yeah, totally. And to be honest with you, we had a great time. It was wonderful. And, you know, I, I'm like, gosh, I was like, oh, my God, my my Long Island accent. And I'm sure people are out there like, what makes you think you lost it? But I don't know. It was like, uh, and the other thing is, I was going to say was, Lance and I, believe it or not, we're trying to do a character. Like, you know how you did Frank Hope, you did a character. But obviously, you were much better at it than we were. And, you know, I guess at the last minute, we were trying, what's the collecting we enjoy? Like, I, <laughs> it didn't work is basically what I'm trying to say. <laughs> well, no, you guys were great guests. So uh, I think there's maybe just one more clip here of uh, okay. Carl Stroiken sharing something at the end. Uh, now, uh, uh, now uh, there was a, a topic that I, I wanted to talk about before, and I, I just remembered uh, Mr. Stroiken. Now, you've been working on a, a project to transfer brainwave patterns. Or what, what is that all about? Well, whenever I, uh, I'm not doing any... Uh, acting in a movie, uh, 
I work on some fringe science projects, and one of them is uh, about transferring uh, brain waves from one person to the other. Uh, there are a few uh, people, a few documented cases of people who sleep only two hours per night and are otherwise perfectly well adjusted and happy. Mm -hmm. um, and that that would just be wonderful if it would only need two hours uh, of sleep per night. So I'm trying to come up with a machine that would read the brainwave pattern of these people and transfer it onto somebody else so that they also only have to sleep two hours per night. Wow, and that's not science fiction, that's real. You're, you're really uh, working on it. Well, I'm working on it, yeah. It may turn out to be science fiction. Well, maybe uh, uh, I could transfer some of my uh, brainwaves with David and make him a nicer person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Or, or David, maybe you could transfer your brainwaves with Leslie sometime. <laughs> I don't think that would work out too good. You don't want to do that, Leslie? Nah, okay. That makes me a little nervous. Okay. Now, uh, well, let's uh, uh, go down now. Uh, we're uh, winding up. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Lance and uh, Pat, now you guys... Uh, uh, you, you'll be uh, continuing with your collections? Yes. That's right. We yeah. almost forgot to mention, Frank, because we know you have a special feeling for this, but we brought a uh, Kittles along. I don't know if you remember those. Oh, Kittles. I love Kittles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, we brought that along for you. Anything special that you guys are looking for, like something that you really want that you don't have S yet? S there's some things. There's uh, food products that people just threw out, like there were uh, Libby Land dinners, TV dinners for kids that we're looking for. And was that the Libby song? No. That was... No, yeah, but they might have used it. Okay. Uh, it's yeah. All right. Well, if anybody has that, and uh, Leslie, we'll see you at the conventions. Okay. Hopefully. All right. Hopefully. And uh, Izzy, uh, you'll be uh, doing more songs, creating. Can I just find out one little song, one verse or so? All right. Well, let me just uh, get to Mr. Stryken, and then you can sing us out, okay? Okay. I'll and, sing uh, you out. Mr. Stryken will watch for the Adams Family, and uh, and hopefully many more uh, projects. Mm -hmm. and thanks. Thanks for coming, and and uh, so Mr. Pertel now is going to sing a final song. The song is composed for my granddaughter, I call her the lawn, and this is the way it goes. I love the lawn in every way. I love the lawn each single day. I love the lawn, it's really true. Just tell the lawn that we love you. I love the lawn every day. I love the lawn every way. Yay. Thanks for watching Beyond Vaudeville. Uh, tune in next week for um, another exciting event. Wow. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> so Leslie Holcomb, um, you know, uh, we had met him at uh, one of the creation conventions and he was kind of typical of a lot of the the guys that you'd meet at these conventions when sure. you were selling your toys yeah 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 definitely yeah it, you know it's a you know it's hey man you know it's so funny because like in a way the internet has sort of brought a lot of people together that otherwise wouldn't really know how to connect right i mean sort of the same idea uh, when you think about it you know but uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and uh stephen corn who uh was the director on all of our shows says hi pat you looking at your watch has always been one of my favorite moments in all of the Beyond Vaudeville episodes. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> Yikes. Um, so Carl Stroiken, you know, one of the things looking back at these episodes, uh, you know, lots of moments I'd forgotten. And um, it sounded like he was experimenting with with basically trying to do the Frankenstein well and you know that's what I was gonna ask you so he was like a scientist or something I, I guess I didn't I would I didn't remember that yeah oh okay yeah yeah I I, I don't know but he, uh, but the, the idea of trying to transfer one person's brain waves into another person's brain waves it's um yeah I, I like I said earlier you never knew what people were gonna bring up on yeah, it, so. that was that was something <laughs> I didn't even remember that I was like what is he talking about <laughs> I remember the singing guy, you know. Him, I remember the songs. He I remember the singing in Yiddish. I remember that too. I thought that was funny. Yeah. Uh, let's see in comments. Uh, Kiwi's Big Adventure, Kiwi's Big Adventure uh, says, Is David still alive? Yes, David is uh, very much still alive. Um, by the way, in the um, it, it came up in that uh, in your segment um, 
about uh, Pee Wee Herman and Pee Wee's Playhouse. Um, right. Oh, you have a Pee Wee. Yeah, I was going to. I have. Believe it or not, I have. I know. I got to look at the camera. I, I think we're transferring bra uh, brain waves right yeah, now. Maybe, maybe, because actually, I had the, I had the whole, I had the Playhouse. I have all the figures. Wow. That was, when you talk about, I got a quick story about that. Was. Um, when that toy came out, like Lance and I, we loved it. We were like, this is like when we were kids. These toys look like when we were kids. And we were at a convention, and one of the uh, guys who did the toys, we, we, you know, we ran into and taught, you know, he's a toy collector too. And we were like, yeah, you know, you did. This. And he said, yeah. And, and he said, that was Paul Rubin. I mean, he, that, he loved all that stuff too. Like, he loved all those Matt Masons. And he used to pull, you know, he used to use those as props too in his show. Like you say, with Hugo, you were talking about that. So he was a big toy fan. And, it, you know, and then they, they, they made these things called fun packs, Pee Wee's fun packs, which I swear you could opened up in the 60s and like thought they were like 60s toys. You know what I mean? It was, yeah, it was amazing. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I bought, when those things went cheap, Oh, I bought tons and tons. And we were talking off stage. The thing I always love to tell people with my toy insanity uh, is the, if you can picture those uh, uh, Rubbermaid 18 gallon, the typical blue tub thing. Right. And I want to I was try to do this on air. We were talking before. I said, let's do it on air. So I want you in your head to think of how many of those tubs I have filled with toys. But don't tell me the number. OK. OK. And then what I want you to do is get the number in your head. Tell me you have the number. Right. Now, this okay. is what you presently have. What I presently have filled with toys. OK. okay. So I want you to get a number. Uh -huh. OK. Tell me when you got the number. Yep. And now I want you to double it <laughs> and tell me that number. Uh, the number I am landing at is 100. So 200. Wow. Oh, no, wait. Oh, no. Oh, so your number. So you said 50 and you doubled it to 100. Is that what you said? Right. I have 284. <laughs> that's right. I, that's like a little thing I always do an icebreaker. But to be honest with you, I've been selling them. So in fairness, I'm down to like 230. So okay. I have now, rid of a lot of stuff, but I still have a lot of stuff to go, you know? So, so one of my questions for someone who, who becomes as uh, obsessive as you, as you guys do with this, some toy collectors at a certain point, are there diminishing returns because of the cost of storing these items? Uh, absolutely. Well, I don't. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because uh, for the longest time I had uh, I had, before I had a house, I'd stored at my sister's and, you know, my sister would put up with it. But like, you know, sometimes like I, I remember the basement leaked once and she, you know, moved some stuff and things like that. And people said, oh, what do you, you know, and I was like, you know, it's the cost of doing business. If I was paying every month to store this, I'd have to figure it into the price, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, so I always, I never paid for storage. I knew that, you know, that's a losing battle. But uh, it's still, you know, it's similar. Like, I, I, th I think of it as like there's something in your brain that's doing it. Because like I say, I still find like, I was going to give you an example of these like figures that I saw. And I'm like, these are going to be good because people aren't buying them and they're going to remember them. And, you know, like, and, and uh, you know, so like, uh and Toys R Us went out of business. I don't know if you remember that. I couldn't help myself, you know, when they were. And were Lionel you know, Kitty City. Yeah. Well, that's even older. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lionel Kitty City went out. Like, you know, Toys R Us is pretty recent. That's what I'm saying. This is how bad I am at it. Like, I've been doing it that recently, you know. I try to stop, you know, but it's it's difficult. So, My nephew's a collector, and I try to put it, like, on him like so i'll call him do you have this figure do you have this figure and it said you know it's just to keep me going because it's like in my blood you know i had two quite uh follow-up questions about the yeah. peewee toys you mentioned that you bought up a bunch of them when they went cheap i'm presuming that was after he got caught in the x-rated theater yeah, yeah well you know yeah a little bit and actually even a little, little yeah that didn't help for sure but the, yeah the show goes off the air the, the toy line goes and uh, yeah, we were buying them for 99 cents, like tons of them, you know, hundreds of dollars we spent. And I may be down to like you said, and I've been selling them at shows and stuff. I may be down to six or seven of them when I had hundreds. hundreds. When, Paul, when Paul Rubens got busted at the um, X rated movie theater in Florida, the, it, there was uh, a triple. Uh, it, it was uh, uh, three movies that were playing there. Can you name any of those movies? No, not even close. Re right. Regular, re wait, regular movies or the porno movies? No, there were three adult movies uh, okay, playing when he got busted there. Okay. 
if if anyone can name them, let's see uh, let's see if you can answer those in chat. I know uh, I'll give you one of them was named Nance Nursey. Oh, really? No, impressive. Nurse Nancy. Wait, and you just remember this? <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> Nurse Nancy. Uh, I believe Candy Stripers and Tiger Shark. 2000 or 3000, something like that. Really? Um, yeah, I, I, that's off the top of my head. So yeah. somebody out there is probably fact checking that right now. Yeah, uh, right. The other question was um, with, with Paul Rubens passing away, does that suddenly represent a boost in, in the value of it? Yeah, it raises an awareness, you know, because people think about it. Oh yeah. Pee wee. And, and to your point, like the, the, after the scandal that's long gone and like, of course people remember it, but it's not as outrageous anymore. And it's more, you know, more memory of the show. And, right. and, and I think that show was so successful. I mean, the movies too, of course, but uh, the show I think was so successful. I keep going back to, cause it, reminded me of a 60s show, you know, and, and I think, and you know, it's funny because I've done that. I've shown it to my nieces and nephews, my son, when he was really little, you know, in the DVDs, he loved it. And it's, it's amazing if you put it. And actually one of my nieces had a kid, she was over and I said, you got to watch this mesmerized. It's so <laughs> wild. It's wild. Um, um, Scott dog is saying in chat, my Lidsville lunchbox is oh, signed by Butch Patrick. It's a treasure. That is fantastic. Yeah, Lidsville. That's a great example when you were talking about like sort of uh, odd collectibles that mean a lot, you know, but maybe not in the bigger world. But like Cinematic Croft is like not everybody collects it, but those who do, whew, they love it. You know, I used to have a big uh, I used to like Cinematic Croft. I had like uh, I, I didn't have the Lidsville. I had the. Uh, Bugaloo's lunchbox, and I had the uh, it was a, and Wonderbug. Like it, if you turned it, had different ones. I had the Electric Woman and Dino Girl board game. That was a good one. Uh, so yeah, it was yeah. Cinnamon Croft is obviously our generation's you know acid trip that we can't get out of our heads. You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, uh, let's see. Uh, Dennis Devine is saying I admire Pat's collection. Can we find him on eBay, etc.? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, Amuse Films is my uh, is my eBay ha handle, and you can see I actually have a picture of me in front of my Planet Ape collection at the time. You know, so you can see I had all that stuff. But uh, yeah, it's, I, I, it's funny. Like once, to, you know, we were talking earlier. Like it's funny. Like once it goes, it goes, and like with, with very few exceptions. Like I, I like to keep like my Matt Mason. I just need the box. I like the one box GI Joe. I don't have to have all the uh, things. I'm just gonna quickly show you if you know just because i set this up here uh some of the other stuff i had the uh the parts family you know uh the uh, monkeys speaking of the monkeys you know and then uh i had the, are those yeah, both uh cord corgi um uh yeah, uh, yeah corgi yeah 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 corgi. i think that's right okay. no i think this might be uh i think this might be johnny lightning i think i'm not sure the the bus I don't know if you could see like, and also wacky packages. You remember them? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just, uh, it was, uh, yeah, you kind of go crazy and, and like spies were a big deal when we were kids. That was like my brother. My brother was you know, that helped. That's changes collecting too. Like um, to have a brother two years older than you, cause you get his toys kind of thing. So like spies would have been a little bit before me, but my, my brother loved them. And so spy like James Bond, man from uncle, all that kind of stuff was like such a big deal. You know, Erwin Allen, when we talked about cinema, Croft, Erwin Allen, right. I have, uh, you know, the less of pace robot, that kind of stuff, you know, it, it, it does something in your mind that you remember and you connect and I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah. I, uh, uh, one of the earliest toys I remember was a, uh, uh, the James Bond attache case. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really valuable item. Which I was way too uh, young for. I I don't maybe three or something. And for some reason, my parents thought I would uh, want to play um, international spy at, at age three. Um, but <laughs> but it was a really cool toy. Uh, before you go, Rich, I just, I wanted to say how we originally met because I thought it was kind of a funny story. Uh, oh yeah, you know, we, were, we were in the college days. Uh, I was at SVA. You went to NYU, I think. Is that yeah. Right? Yeah. And, you know, the typical college party we were there. And actually, Lance, Lance would have this wild time where he'd love to, like, uh, go to people and not harass. I guess you could say, you know, like joke around with their things and stuff. And we saw you 
And you were so like straight looking. And we were like, oh, we're going to have a good time with this guy. And we started talking. And I was like, your responses were so funny. And I was like, and and we bonded on G.I. Joe. And, and we were talking about, and I could tell, like, it was very funny because I remember uh, there was one, to- we're around the same age. And like, you know, it was like that thing where you kind of got to give up G.I. Joe, but you still like it. You're at that age where, where, where you know, and uh, I remember we mentioned the vehicle and he, and you were like, oh, I had that vehicle. I was like, ah, oh, you were technically too old when that came out. And he goes, oh, and you went, oh, that didn't leave the house. That didn't leave the house. <laughs> and I just remember that that was actually, that's how we bonded was our, our toy collecting and stuff. And then our love of old TV and stuff like that. And it went on from there. And, and that was the, you know, uh, the G.I. Joe mobile support vehicle. Also yeah, the mobile, really right. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And, yeah. and it was it was it was just funny how like that stuff would happen. Like, you know, now I, I laugh and, you know, like you say, it kind of I, I, I don't I might have told you at the beginning. I'm not sure if I repeat myself, but uh, uh, when I, I was in high school and I saw a collection of uh, G.I. Joe's at a garage sale. And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember these and things. But I didn't do anything because like I didn't I didn't know you could collect them. It didn't it didn't. Uh, I didn't get that, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's what happened. And that started. And I don't know, I just, the love of toys. And it's funny because they often say, uh, you know, your love of toys, because it was a moment in time that you love so much that, you know, I don't know, psychologically, I'm talking out my butt and what I've read, but uh, they say often the people that bond to this stuff actually had terrible childhoods. It was like <laughs> their little hope. And that's why they're so connected to it. So it's not like, usually when you had a, a very normal childhood, happy you know, you appreciate it, but it's not a big deal. And, yeah. Uh, so well, there you go. You can take that for what it's worth. I mean, look, everybody loved their toys, right? And <laughs> yeah. uh, and everyone misses the toys that they love the most. You know. So, yeah. um, sure. uh, uh, someone's asking, uh, did uh, uh, can you please talk about your time in the Mosquitoes, the band that I mentioned at the top yeah. of the show, and the recent reissue of the band's recordings? Yeah, I have one right here. We, uh, it was kind of a fun story where. Uh, you know, it's funny, like the guys reach out to you and they, and they, you know, get permission. It was actually uh, Blair Buscarino, a good friend of ours who, and he, he used to have a zine back in the day, wrote it, sort of got the, uh, the ball rolling. Bill Jones was another one. They, they were like, you know, they were like enthusiasts and stuff. So they, they come to us and like, is it okay if we pursue a thing? And, and, you know, we're like, yeah, I don't care. You know, I, or this songs, yeah, do whatever you want to do. <laughs> and, and then when it happens, you're like, oh, this is kind of cool. You know, <laughs> you know, it's like none of the work, but you get all of the accolades, you know, they did all the, the heavy lifting and stuff. And, and they released a, a, a two CD set fun it chronicles because i was in the band and i quit and they got another drummer so it sort of chronicles the the history of the of the group and and it's funny like it became very nostalgic to uh go back to this time you know and uh it was funny because i if i could tell a quick not to get too lost we got back together for like a you know like a you know just a band reuniting thing and uh i wanted to do a show in new york city and so i approached uh, Arlene's Grocery, which is kind of a hip kind of little club. And I, and I said to him, look, you know, we're old, you know, you know, but, and I, I'm telling you, people will come to this thing. I said, but it's got to be over early. And I said, you, you, you know, the people come and they'll buy a lot of liquor. It's not like they have to nurse a beer They're They get make money. Right. But I said, it's got to be done by 10. It can't start at 10. So we did this show and we called it a garage party. We did seven to 10 sold out. They, they were blown away by it. So, and then of course, like other bands, I'd been in a couple other bands and they're like, hey, why don't we do one? Hey, why don't we? And we ended up doing like five or six of them. And our last one just got shut down because of COVID, which was kind of funny, you know, when the bands went under. And it was funny too, because I don't know if you remember, like not everybody, they were talking about closing, but it wasn't mandatory yet. And they weren't deciding, they were going to have. And I remember going to the, to the to, uh, Arlene's, I'm like, you got to understand a lot of these guys are in their sixties. They can't be going out, you know, to play <laughs> COVID. it's not like they're 18, you know, it's not <laughs> like they're not worried about it. So uh, that was, and then the last, I just want to say that we did a, a sort of our last waltz. We called it the last stomp because we used to do a song called let's stomp. And mm-hmm. we, and we basically had a lot of friends come up and do a mosquito song with us, uh, a different playing guitar or singing. And my son's band, was the backup group because, you know, we couldn't learn a bunch, you know, 20, 30 songs, you know, and, uh, but it was a lot of fun and that just recently happened and, and again, sold out, but it had to be done by 10 o'clock. That was our big, uh, 
<laughs> you know, it's just funny. Like, I think there's a lot of people that want to go to shows that still like to see live music. But like, I, you know, I'll go see my son play and it's like, oh, you're going on at 11 o'clock. Oh, I can't handle it. <laughs> and, uh, and the name of your son's band? Oh, uh, Cupid's Nemesis. Yeah, I should plug them. They're, they're terrific, and uh, and they're, they're a really fun band to play. And uh, yeah, they, he's still playing uh, a lot and stuff. I saw uh, he had done the concert, I think, with FMU, and he, he was doing a. Oh, yeah. uh, they did yeah. a cover of uh, Wipeout, which was amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they do. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's funny, uh, and and the other stuff like FMU that they wrote all those songs. They're 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 a talented group, you know. These guys, yeah. Great yeah, uh, someone named InSpot is saying, what a handsome man Pat Bashao is. Oh, go on. <laughs> are, you some, are you somehow typing? Somebody I know, I'm sure. I, are I you typing see. secretly but beneath those G.I. Joes? Is that you writing these things? <laughs> yeah, really, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, does, does Pat have any mask collectibles? Ma uh, the, the, the old the toy mask? I, I guess the movie yeah. mask? The yeah. The oh, no. uh, oh, Jim Carrey yeah. movie. Those aren't so. I, you know, it's funny. I just recently sold some uh, from the from the Jim Carrey movie. But there's also a cartoon called Masks, and it was like it was sort of like uh, uh, Transformers, like you know wow. they, they turn from people, you know whatever things. And uh, they're catching fire. That people are getting into those. I, I have a few, nothing, nothing really big. And you know, like when I was saying before about my 200 uh, bins, I often. Uh, you know, don't realize what I have. I unpack it, you know, and when I try to do my eBay, I try to make it like a nice swath of stuff. I don't want to sell only He-Man, only things. So I always keep digging them out and I'm like, oh, this will be fun, you know, because I, uh, uh, you know, I like to see, you know, the different things. If you, uh, I'm Amusement Films on uh, Instagram. I always post my auctions. You can see the stuff I've sold and stuff. And, you know, it's big movie. Oh, you know, I, I was going to say, I wanted to show you some other things. I just, because uh, before we go, uh, uh, Ghostbusters toothpaste. I always love that uh, strange stuff that they would license, you know. And I was actually thinking when, when you showed that clip and we're talking about cereal boxes, a lot of cereal boxes had you bought when you saw that show are value. Urkel, uh, uh, those are Adam's family. They had a box, you know, that stuff is actually okay now, which is kind of yeah. funny because, you know, back then it was like brand new. So Crazy. Yeah. And they're all long gone, those cereal boxes that we had on oh. the show. I, um, I, I, I had to show you my uh, Sting Dune figure. I thought that was kind of funny. You know, that's a good one, right? Because <laughs> it's Sting. Does that uh, does that figure have a good personality? Yeah, <laughs> that I can't answer. I don't. Okay. Know. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's see. What else do we have? Um, uh, so, uh, people are asking about Leslie Holcomb. Is he still alive? I'm I'm not sure to be honest. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't. We'll know have to see if we can track him down. Uh, yeah. Uh, someone did ask of uh, House Joey the Monkey. Well, we lost uh, uh, John Walsh, who played Joey the Monkey uh, uh, a few years ago, unfortunately. But, um, uh, Pat, any memories of John? Because you knew John pretty well. Oh, I love John. John was one of the funniest guys. And, you know, not for nothing, but he he helped us a lot. You know, he, he was, you know, he worked for some... Uh, Magazines, I don't know if we should say, you Some know, adult uh, magazines, yes, yeah, Screw and, and and uh, Penthouse, right? And you know, Lance was a very talented artist and he got him work. And wow. we, we used to go there, at, you know, he we used to hang out with him at uh, Penthouse and Screw, you know, he was he was a really funny guy. I mean, I, I and you know, it's funny when the monkey, the, the monkey, Joey the monkey is almost, I almost feel it's like a disservice to how funny this guy was, you know, and he was on, uh, uh you know, uh, the what was it? Uh, Attack of the Show? Uh, G4, yeah. G4, yeah. And he used to do these skits. I mean, he was a producer. He was kind of behind the scenes. But every once in a while, he would do uh, these skits. And I'm telling you, I would cry laughing. He did the outtakes from Superman where he played Marlon Brando. And he was giving, like, advice for Superman. <laughs> like, wipes are handy. You, you would be surprised. <laughs> uh, I remember... So uh, and, and I remember just, John telling me when he was at G4 that he he wanted to do a piece on uh, uh, Cheetah the monkey was still alive the Cheetah from the old Tarzan movies. You know how was, old would that have been? That would have been old at that time, right? These yeah. monkeys live long. Uh, this was yeah. sometime in the uh, early 2000s, I think. And he was living in Palm Springs in a in a house with his trainer, and uh, John got there with like a two guy crew. And um, the first thing they, they go in the door and uh, the trainer says, um, 
Okay, now before you meet Cheetah, I just want to point something out. Uh, right out there, uh, out those sliding doors is the swimming pool. If um, if Cheetah starts acting up, we'll tell you to jump in the pool and you'll be okay. Um, and <laughs> they, fortunately, they never had to jump in the pool, uh, but he said it was pretty scary uh, being scary. there with this big old uh, uh, Cheetah. Yeah. Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kiwi's Big Adventures asking, how did you meet Underdog Lady? Well, Kiwi, fortunately, this episode is going to live on uh, forever on YouTube. And you can go back and watch the beginning of this. Where were you then? When we were talking about <laughs> really, you get to the show. I'm, I'm happy to come anytime. That's, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Pat, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been uh, oh, it was just fun catching up with you too. You know, I mean, absolutely. We, we used to hang out all the time, uh, and it's funny. Life takes you in different directions, but it's yeah. It's you're in New York, and I'm in yeah. LA, and, and and that's what happens. Oh, this <laughs> life thing. And then just a quick shout out. I want to say, uh, Rich plays a little part in one of my. Uh, our, my recently released uh, Soul Tangle DVD. There's an extra on it for a, a, a trailer called The Dead of Night Town. He plays the mad doctor. I don't know if you'd recognize him, but he's in it. That's what I wanted to say. So. Wow. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm Good glad thing. you mentioned that because uh, that, uh, that now I know, now I know I was in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Always a blast. Uh, yes. Always a blast. Uh, Soul Tangler, uh, one of many uh, cult uh, movies by Pat. And um, yeah, uh, just a multi-talented guy. And uh, oh, so on. happy to have had you here, Pat. And, oh, it was uh, great. I had such a good time, Rich. And, so much fun. Uh, yeah. And thank you, everybody. Uh, Braxton uh, uh, Baltruzak saying, really enjoyed the show. Uh, good. Glad you enjoyed that, Braxton. And if you did, hit like and subscribe if you haven't already. Tell your friends, come on, we want to hit the big 3,000 subscribers before the end of the year. Let's do it, people. Come on. Oh, a last plug, if I could say, uh, I have yes. a, a web series that's over now, but it's called We Might Be Superheroes. You can see it on YouTube, or you could go to wemightbesuperheroes.com, and you can see it there. I think you'd like it. It's fun. 30 episodes. All right. Sounds good, Pat. Good uh, again, uh, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks, oh, everybody, thanks. for Thank watching. You. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, really, uh, oh, Braxton did already like, and subscribe. Toto Payne Diaz says my smile is stuck. Kiwi's big adventure says great show. Vox Clement says happy holidays, everybody. Okay. This could go on all night. So we better stop it. Uh, thanks again, everybody. And, uh, watch tomorrow. We're going to do our Benny Bell tribute, Mr. Shaving Cream himself. Uh, one of my all-time uh, musical heroes. So uh, uh, be sure to check at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. Thanks again. Bye.